long ago in a living room very much like yours. Two women made up a podcast on how movies link up to each other, and they called it Six Degrees of Feature Film. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Six Degrees of Feature Film podcast. I am Miss Movies. I am Stacy Howard. And today we have a special guest on our show. It is Mr. John Roca, and he's taking a sip of his drink, so he's Hello. not ready to speak. I'm sorry, you're catching me after <laughs> I finished recording movie fights about, like, 35 minutes ago, I rushed over here from traffic and I had to deal with uh, Scott Mance. I mean, yes. And Kim Horcher. I don't know if you guys know her. She was great. I don't. Yeah, Nerd, she's on Nerd Alert. And mm-hmm. uh, she has a bunch, of, she has a couple of shows, I guess. She was really great. And she, while Bance and I battled it out like a couple of lions, she undercut and played it well. So we'll see what happens. Well, good. And this podcast will probably air way after the fact. Right. So, right. hey, you can just tell us who won. No. Yeah. And then. <laughs> It'll uh, already have been out by then. I guess so, but I don't want to take the chance. Okay. Well, today we are talking about uh, post apocalyptic. Thanks for having me on. Thank yeah, oh, you're welcome. Me. Thanks for coming Thanks. on. You guys. Yeah. We're excited. So, today we're talking about post apocalyptic films, and we are starting out with our feature film. How it works is we take a feature film and we show how six other films link up to that feature film by some sort of theme or actor or director or things like that. Um, so, the feature film that we're starting with today is Mad Max Fury Road. Which I'm assuming everyone has seen this. Yes. Yeah. Okay, good. You did your homework. Fantastic. Mm-hmm. So it's the synopsis is a woman rebels against a tyrannical ruler in post apocalyptic Australia in search of her homeland with the help of a group of female prisoners, a psychotic worshiper, and a drifter named Max. Mm-hmm. Starring Tom Hardy, Charlize Theron, Nicholas Holt, and a slew of other people. Morton Joe. Yep, and he was also Jeez. in, this is his second Mad Max film. Yeah, yeah, he played a different role in another Mad Max film. Right, the oh. first one, Toe Cutter. The Toe Cutter. Mm-hmm. Think of him. What do you think, like, what is the, what's the decision there by the director of, I'm going to use this actor again, but it's not going to be the same character. Why? I think he just likes the guy. He's like, yeah, I'll use him again. <laughs> sure. They're just buds. They're like, Yeah. <laughs> Go shoot another movie in the desert. Let's do it. Well, I think it's great because it's re—it's bringing the franchise back again. So why not bring it back with the guy who like was the main villain in the first one, and that's mm-hmm. who he was—the main villain in the first one. So make him the villain in this sure. one. Sure. And he's so unrecognizable because of the mask and the, the white makeup and the hair. Mm-hmm. Um, I just—I thought it was great. Like nobody knew it was him until they released it and said it was him. You know, mm-hmm. it was unrecognizable because right. the first one is very young and very noticeable. But what, then the question is, why not Mel Gibson? I mean, I know that was part of it at one point. Like, mm-hmm. they were going to have him back, and then at some point it it was done. Like, we're not going to do that. Yeah, they were going to do it in, like, 2004, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Just, they probably started filming at that probably. time just anyways, because yeah. <laughs> it's been so much for this to get off the ground. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he, sh- he shot this in 2012. Yeah. So it, it's just now coming into the public consciousness in 2015, so it's fascinating. Yeah, you know, Charlize she... Theron's hair has already grown out. No, no. <laughs> right. Yeah, it's been so long. Nicholas is such a man now. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. <laughs> you know, he's such a boy there. But yeah, I think because they are gonna re- they were going to restart it, so they had to kind of pick an actor who could be there and be mm-hmm. believable. And Mel is in his, plus all the off-camera stuff. Right. Mm-hmm. So you don't want to start with him, I guess, and start over there. Yeah. Now, this was my first Mad Max film. What about you, Stacey? This is my first one, and then okay. I went back. Right. Wow. Mm-hmm. I haven't seen Thunderdome though. Not yet. Like no. that's. We don't need another hero. <laughs> Tina Turner. That's all I know about Thunderdome. <laughs> she's in it, and she sings something. All I know is two men enter, one man leaves. Yeah. That's it. That's all I've got from that. But they have those at Burning Man apparently. Where people, really? Yeah. People. What do they have? The Thunderdome, where you can, if you you haven't seen it, so. In the Thunderdome, you can actually fight, and you're attached to like bands, so you jump and hit. And, okay. And they actually have that at Burning Man. So Do you go fun. to Burning no, Man? No, Is my this your thing? Go. Okay, my I was just go. wondering. So you can Do like I? fight someone <laughs> yeah. at Burning Man with the uh, with the sticks, like the. That sounds stick. cool. Yeah, it's a really fun time, and you don't obviously you're not there to hurt anybody. There to have fun. Oh, I was gonna I say, would. Burning Man doesn't sound like a place yeah. where you're there yeah. to actually like <laughs> do some damage to yeah. someone, so but sticks. I'm not sure. When I first when I first saw this in the theater. I actually like at the very beginning was like I don't I don't like this like I don't yeah and then by about the time when Charlize was like taking over the the show I was like oh I'm into this now like 
this is, but the beginning, I was like, it's all so gross and ew, I don't See, like I this. See, I like that. He puts a lizard in oh. his mouth. But, oh, I was in. I was in <laughs> from that moment on. I was like, yeah, I'm ready. Let's go. And even though I'd never seen a Mad Max film and I didn't know you know, the lore, I didn't know anything about it or what it was supposed to be from that first shot, that first mm-hmm. second. I was like, this is going to be an incredible film. Even if it's just visually, it's going to be stunning. So I, like, yeah. knew. I was totally on board. What was your, what are your favorite parts? Um, I mean, everything in the movie. <laughs> the whole but, film. <laughs> both of, but I guess my favorite part would be when um, Tom Hardy's character is trying to shoot something and he can't quite get aim. And so then he kneels down and puts his shoulder right here and then Charlie Theron's character mm. takes aim and, and gets it. That's a good and movie. that's not like a lot of people have discussed what that moment means and the whole feminist, you know, like everything, like what it's trying to symbolize. And I, I think right. it's just trying to symbolize she's just a better shot. And it doesn't matter if you're a man or a woman. Yep. It's really not have to be a, an in-depth discussion. She's just a better shooter, and that's okay. And sometimes right. you're, you know, like men and women, they're not better than each other. They're equal, right. you know? I, yeah, I hope some point. I hope at some point we move past all that yeah. shit. Like, I know that has to be there. We have to go this transition phase where women are now more accepted as leads in these kinds of mm-hmm. films, or they're just, just as powerful and capable as men. Mm-hmm. I'm just hoping this finally ends once and for all we get past it. You know what I'm saying? Because it's like... It's of course that was always true. That was mm-hmm. always possible. That was always there. It's just that, you know, executives or whatever didn't accentuate or didn't make it a big deal. And now it's every time it happens, like, oh, it's a woman. It's like, let's, let's move mm-hmm. past it. I think it's awesome to trumpet it and start. But then we've got to get, like, I hope we get past it in a few years. And it's like nobody cares. Like it's a woman who's the lead. Who cares? Yeah, She's I think gonna it's, it's going to be more accepted versus yeah. consciously having like trying to make it a thing. Like yeah. it's just a part of the film. It's already happening. The thing of the film, right? You know, and it's already happening with Star Wars with with this, like we said, and, and mm-hmm. there are a couple other properties that are you know, female Thor, all that stuff. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, how long does it take to get a female led superhero film? Well, I mean, really, with Captain I'm, Marvel's coming, so uh, yeah, but le- how many films have we yeah, had? Right. Like that's I. We could talk all day about how frustrated I am about that, but we're not going you don't to. Like Catwoman? Um, you don't like Halle no, I'm talking I about mean... down to now. <laughs> but I, what I mean is like when the boom started, like when Iron Man came out, like that was kind of the start, like the revive of mm-hmm. comic book movies. And since Iron Man has come out, there have been zero female superhero led films. Yeah. Well, and true. so that's where my anger stems um but my favorite part of this film is uh the road fight where they have the metronome where the guys are like up on the top like which he took from Cirque du Soleil which I think is just amazing and there's actually kind of if you because I saw this movie first and then I saw the road warrior I saw like a hint of this in the road warrior like oh hey that's where he like he took that moment and he Mm -hmm. made it into a fight for this film. So I really like how many different homages there are to the different films. There's that, there's, this is the second movie where when you first are with Max and Charlize and she shoots his gun at him and notices there's no bullets. Like that's the second time that that's happened where it's like, oh, you don't have bullets. Like, (laughs) and then, (laughs) and the music box, bringing that back to Road Warrior as well. Um, and just the idea of even in, in Road Warrior is um, coming having to go back. You go somewhere and you have to come back to where you came from. And I just, I really appreciate that he put all that in and made it so that way, you know, it's familiar to us. So that's why we like it. It's like comfort food. Mm-hmm. But yeah. for me, it's the opposite because I saw this first and then I saw I saw him in such a random order. Yeah. So this one, and then Road Warrior, and then Mad Max. And I'm like, I don't know why I do this sometimes. Why don't I just start start to finish? Well, you really, for these movies, you really yeah. don't have to see them in it's order. True. And they're it's, all, it's, it's not like yeah. it's, you know, they all connect, really. They're just right. stories of different, you know. Just another story yeah, that always end the same of him leaving. Yeah. It's always him leaving. And so it's great the way you did it, though. I mean, because in a way, you've gone, like, the first one for you was a prequel. Mm-hmm. Whereas for most of us who watched it in order, it was the foundation from which these other, these other ones sprung from. So it's fascinating for you to go back to see these little things about Max in the different right. movies, and then watch their uh, watch their uh, creation in the first one. My my favorite stuff is the sandstorm. The sandstorm stuff is effing brilliant. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's just one of the, yeah. one of the greatest things that that I've ever seen on film visually. And I, I went to Comic Con and saw the eight minutes he released before there was ever a trailer. And I. 
my mind like exploded at the scope and the vastness of what he was able to create. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, this is a guy who all the other films are uh, smaller films. You know, they're mm -hmm. very much known for ind being independent. I mean, he did Babe. So, I mean, where in his mind did he create? Or was it Babe Two? No, it was the first one. Okay. <laughs> 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 let's, let's have the correct titles in there. Sorry about movies. that. Movies, <laughs> but like, it's it's just all of that, and then the visual, just the visual creation of that world. I thought the scope of it was amazing. Mm -hmm. Is there anything we didn't like about it? No. <laughs> okay. What You're good. You I'm just wondering. I didn't have anything that I didn't like about it. I mean, I didn't like the beginning where I was like, I hate these people. They're all disgusting. What is going on? <laughs> yeah, like, I, you, yeah. I don't want to live here. Get me out. Like, why Why is this happening? I but... hate to break you. That's our future. It's <laughs> apocalyptic. Oh, please. Humans are going to be disgusting. Um, well, yeah. Yes. The only thing I hated was seeing that dude's feet that were uh, the fat, disgusting Oh, yeah. Guy's Those feet. were gross. I, like, oh. I can't handle that oh, yeah. kind of physical ailment. <laughs> So let's go ahead and link this up to another post-apocalyptic film that John has chosen. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah. Because it fits so easily in. Right. Well, I made the obvious choice, right? What we talked about, Mad Max mm -hmm. to Road Warrior. That was my obvious choice. Now, what do I do here? Do I do a synopsis? We just, or sure, go on. All right. You take the <laughs> mic. Guess, take the lead. Know, you tell me. I'm telling you, uh, go ahead. <laughs> in the, the post-apocalyptic Australian wasteland, a cynical drifter agrees to help a small, gasoline-rich gasoline -rich community escape a band of bandits. A band of bandits. Mm -hmm. okay, there we go. Band of bandits. Basically, he's a reluctant hero throughout the whole throughout this film. Right? He does not want to help these people. He's just trying to get gas. Mm -hmm. He even stages an exchange because he waits for this couple to leave this area uh, in their buggy and then get attacked by the main villains. And he, only, he never stops the attack. He only goes in there afterwards after the woman's been raped and killed, after the guy is barely alive, and he brings the guy back to this village in order to exchange it for gasoline. Mm -hmm. So it, it's he's not a hero, necessarily. Right. He's a survivor, a survivor, and I think that's the majority of the film, and then eventually he gets uh, dragged into helping them. Which is sad, because thinking of where he started, you know, as this cop, as cop yeah, at, right. like, the kind of the beginning of the apocalypse. We never see what happens, like, what causes the downfall for this society to start bringing up but right. Mad Max itself is right. the beginning and he's it's still there's yeah, yeah they're still trying to keep it together yeah, and and he is that hero and then things happen and he just no longer can be that hero yeah which is sad well for those of you who've seen it like I did research on this film and the rumors were that the feral kid in the film was supposed to be Tom Hardy in right. in the new Mad Max. That's what I but thought. But it wouldn't yeah. make sense. No, right. And George Miller came out and said, it's not him. That's not the timeline we're going with. Right. Mm -hmm. And that Lord Humongous was supposedly Goose from the first movie. Hmm. And had had a psychotic break because he's all, got all those burns on his body. Yeah. And they were gonna say, they were going to say that he was um, Lord Humongous. And he, just had, and he had no memory of any time before that accident with those uh, guys in the first one. Which right. wouldn't, which is awesome. It's still, you can still mentally watch that movie and think he's Goose and it still works. Mm hmm. Huh. Interesting theories. Yeah. But then George Miller was like, nope. Thanks, well, guys. He was for the feral kid. Okay. He, he was okay with it for a while he's, or he said he, no for he, sure. He hasn't said anything about Lord Humongous. Like okay. He said, I don't, you know, he's never committed one way or the other. See, that's what I like about the movies. Like, the whole lore of it, the mythology, it all just kind of exists in George Miller's mind. Right. <laughs> and he may have everything straight and know all the details, but I don't think we ever will. Or he's never going to be like, no, this no. is this, this is this. He's going to let everyone think whatever they want to. And right. each story is its own. Yeah. It's like Greek mythology, and each one is like a different tale of the gods or whatever. Right. So, you know, it's never like we're going to know the whole how everything fits together. Only yeah. George Miller knows that. And we can just make our own interpretations about it or like put our own. Yeah. On Isn't that the best part though? Fan fiction. Yeah. Like coming up. I mean, that's where you get 50 shades of gray. This, that's Ugh. true. Oh, I have so much Toy Story fan fiction and theories. <laughs> really? Yes, oh, we wow. have. Theories and Toy Story. Oh, yeah. there's theories yeah. about You'll Toy You'll get Story. to hear it all. Oh yeah. <laughs> just wait. Just wait till the second episode comes out. Um, yeah. What? I mean, okay, when you pick the Road Warrior, is the Road Warrior your favorite? Oh, yeah. Of the ouvre? Yes, mm -hmm. I would say it's my favorite. Um, just something about this film uh, really solidifies Gibson's acting and Gibson's portrayal mm -hmm. of his character. I think he really lives in this character in this film more than any, any of the other ones. 
Um, and I think there's so much at stake in this film, not just um, his soul. Do you know what I'm saying? Like he, he has to get dragged back into being a good person. And there's something about that that's really moving because he had been he had gone so far the other way after his wife and ki and child were killed in the first one that you know tying people handcuffing people to exploding cars you know as revenge in this one he's more of the typical hero in the end who fights fair who tries to you know like help the, the people get out of the gasoline plus it's it's a 15 minute car chase at the end which is right. almost unheard of on film it's so much uh, amazing uh, action within each of the sections of the car chase scene or of the chase scene. I can't even say car chase scene because this is a tanker. Uh, you know? I wasn't prepared for how good looking Mel Gibson was yeah. as a young man. I, he's handsome. <laughs> it's like, wait a minute. Who is that? Yeah. When's he going to yell at someone over the phone? I'm prepared for a breakdown. For a break, yeah. It's, and it's also his voice in this one. Like in the first one, he got dubbed over for the American audiences. So sometimes you'll hear him a little dub, but in the second one, it's totally his voice, which is, mm -hmm. you get this real feeling of him as an actor. Mm -hmm. Originally, this was supposed to be the conclusion. Yes. It was just supposed to be Mad Max and... The Road Warrior, which then they, I don't know, America decided, let's do Mad Max 2, The Road Warrior, or yeah. something. Something yeah. happened. Or, yeah. like, Mar America them. dropped it and just said The Road Warrior because oh, right. something like Mad Max wasn't that well-received over here or didn't even come over here or something happened. It was an I don't know. thing for right. VHSs and betas at the time. You guys mm -hmm. were, you probably aren't young. Um, I've heard of it. this term, beta? <laughs> <laughs> I used to have betas when I was a kid. Uh, that's what you rented. You mean meta? I yes, the totally meta. meta. Yes, <laughs> the meta beta. Um, but yeah, so they so it didn't get as much, but it was an underground hit here in the states. And then Road Warrior came out with more of a of a um, uh, opening, and so that's why they wanted to name it just Road Warrior instead of Mad Max Two because people weren't that familiar with Mad Max One. Yeah, because this made twenty three million at the uh -huh. box office mm -hmm. in the United States. Mm -hmm. And its budget in Australia was four point five million. So I don't know what the conversion is there, but it can't be higher. And no, <laughs> I'm it can't just be. guessing. That's no, quite true. Uh, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. No, nope. uh, James Cameron cited this as one of his influences for the Terminator. So I thought that was pretty interesting. And yeah. oh yeah, so going back to the whole thing about um, it being the end of the story and yeah. leaving it there. They weren't going to do Thunderdome, but I guess he wanted to do like a Lord of the Flies type of movie. And right. the closest they could come was making a third Mad Max film. Right. They wouldn't approve him doing a Lord of the Flies movie. But when he pitched there as a possibility for a Mad Max 3, then they said, OK, you can go ahead and do it. And, but it only be the construct of the Mad Max universe. Yeah. He only says 16 lines in the whole movie. When did you see this? Mel Gibson. 16 yes. lines. Of the, oh, when did I see it? Yeah. Because both Stacy and I have seen it recently, and yeah. that was our first viewing. Well, so. I just saw it again, no lie, two weeks ago on IFC HD. Because they have a channel now, IFC mm -hmm. HD, where they show them uncut, but there's commercials. Okay. So you have to deal with the commercials, but you do mm -hmm. get it, like the cussing, all the se all the sex, wow. everything that would normally be cut from a regular show. Unedited. Was not unedited, right, it's unedited, which is still fun to enjoy, you know. Um, but yeah, well, I first saw it when I was, what, I don't know, 17, 18 years old. And then, mm -hmm. and I'm 44 now, and so, and then, I, so I see it all the time. Like I watch it. It's one of those films that I watch all over and over and over again because it's a quick one. And I and I had it on beta, and we used to watch it. Like I, we had the first VHSs or V, uh, what do you mean, players, video players? What do you call them back then? VCRs. That's it. We had the first one, one of the first ones on our block, and we had three movies. We had Road Warrior, we had Wildcats, <laughs> and we had Broadcast News, which was really weird, and we would just watch them over and over and over. Again. <laughs> So Road Warrior was definitely... Wait, Wildcats with uh, Goldie, Goldie Hawn? Hawn? Oh, yeah. All right, nice. Oh, yeah, where she plays a football coach. Football right? coach, right. Yep. I remember that. <laughs> and if that happened now, people would make a huge deal. Female football coach. Back in the 80s, we were doing it. What's the big deal? Yeah. So those things. So, you know, and yeah, so so I just... It's one of the films I watch over and over and over again. I love it. What division was she? <laughs> it's a high school football coach. Okay, so all right. Just, division, high school. Uh, uh, high yeah. school. Right. So... Triple A. We just, Stacy and I decided on a film for another post-apocalyptic oh. that we could link to uh, Mad Max Fury Road, and we decided on Children of Men. Stacy's going to take right. this. So um, the synopsis, it's in 2027 in a chaotic world in which women have become somehow infertile, a former activist agrees to help transport a miraculously pregnant woman to a sanctuary at sea. So it stars Clive Bowen. 
Um, my cocaine. Michael Caine. Um, <laughs> Was that your accent? Okay. Like, that's <laughs> yeah. awesome. <laughs> um, Julianne Moore. She would tell Edgy Afor and Claire Hope. Ash. Ashity? Wait, that's her name? Ashity. Yeah. Ashity? Oh. A- <laughs> You got it. It was like You're good. shitty, but it's actually oh, no. Okay. Well, all right. <laughs> I love that um, Chiwetel AG4 didn't throw you off. No, but that no, because <laughs> Oscar season, I was like, ah, oh, I got that one down. But then the next one, I was like, wait, does this like curse words, like giggling like I'm third grade? Okay. So it's directed by Alfonso Caron, who we all love from Gravity, as well as HP3. That's Prisoner right. Prisoner of Azkaban, my favorite yes. Harry Potter movie. Um, its box office was seventy million, but its budget was seventy five million. So it wasn't a big hit. <laughs> and I'm always uh, curious about that because it's such a great film, and it was nominated for at the Oscars for best screenplay, for editing, for cinematography. So it was a yeah. brilliant. What film. went wrong? Like, yeah, what went wrong? It Marketing. Was, I mean, I guess. bringing this out December twenty fifth. This really is not a Christmas. No, this is a movie. depressing movie. No. It's brilliant, but it's depressing. With a budget like $75 million, you'd think that they would have marketing. Yeah, exactly. But, yeah, what went wrong? John, you have yeah. to answer the question. What well, went wrong? Well, I didn't like the movie, so... Oh. You don't like Children of I Men? Re- I find it boring as Oh, well. get off this podcast. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> All I didn't know it was a Nazi podcast. Yeah, <laughs> no, uh, Only our views are allowed. Yes. This is something I struggle with. I've watched that movie five times. Okay. Because I'm trying to understand... <laughs> why I don't like it, hmm. but it bores me to tears. And I don't understand why, because I love, because I'll watch like three hours, I'll watch Wyatt Earp over and over again, the Kevin Costner yeah. movie, and that could be boring to a lot of people. No, y- you reason, know what, I know why. Movie, I know why. It's because this is actually happening right now. Like What is actually happening? This world is happening right now, and there's all these refugees. It's all very depressing because this is the apocalypse that is happening. Depressing never stops me. I like Requiem for a Dream. But that's oh, okay. I depressing. love Lord. Requiem for a Dream. Yeah. <laughs> no, here's that's what depressing. I think is yeah. because usually when you hear the words post-apocalyptic yeah. oh. in the description description for a film, you think it's going to be battles and epic and you know some kind of uh, lots of violence and struggle and everything. And this is a, a very very realistic look at what yes. might actually happen politically, economically, socially. Yeah, they're what still all going to work. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, everyone's still going to work. I I would like lose my mind to be like why am I going why yeah. am I working at Google where I'm going to die in 15 years? Um, and there will be no <laughs> children to live on. Um, the world is over. Um, so I don't know how they like handle life. Um, but yeah, no, it's a really realistic portrayal of, of mm-hmm. what how the world might go into disarray and chaos, but it's a controlled chaos compared to what we're used to. So I think that's why maybe it seems boring. To well, you is also Clive Owen. Never, never, he doesn't always grab me in stuff that he does, you know. And I, so really? I don't, I don't always like. Have you I seen like Closer. The, yeah. Oh. Julie Roberts kills that movie. It's terrible. She's terrible in that movie. What? Croupier is the movie you need to see of Clive Owen. Oh, I heard about that. Yeah, yeah. he's mm-hmm. fantastic in Croupier. But uh, yeah, Closer. I saw the stage play in London, and I, I and when I saw the movie, I was like, no, she doesn't. He's great in that movie. He's great. The scene with him and uh, Natalie Portman in the, the strip scene. Yeah. That is a phenomenal scene. In terms of acting and the dialogue and the delivery between the two, mm-hmm. irrelevant that Natalie's in pasties or whatever. Like yeah. it's just a great. You don't even pay attention. No, I don't. I don't even notice. It. I don't have it saved or anything. But like what I'm saying is <laughs> right, <laughs> right. But no, but it's it's he's a good actor. I think just in certain things, he's not necessarily like the lead guy to take you into things sometimes. Mm-hmm. And I think in this film, it just didn't do it for me. But I respect the film because so many of my friends love it, mm-hmm. and so it's just, it's something that I go. Okay, it's just sometimes you have one of those ones that you have a blind spot about, and I think this is one of the ones for me. But I have tried. I know in the novel, it's the opposite. The men are the ones that are infertile. That's right. Which, they can't produce God forbid like, they do it that way. Yeah. Why can't they do it that so way? Yes. Yeah. How dare they? Executives are like, no way. I love Michael Caine in this, though. He is my favorite part. Stacey, can you please do your Michael? My cocaine. <laughs> <laughs> as long as you say Michael, my cocaine. No, well, yeah, well, that's how it sounds. Honest Trailers, that's their oh, little name right. for him, is my cocaine. But that's, what he, <laughs> 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 but that's how he says it, too. That's so, great. Oh, God. Ridiculous. And he based his performance on John Lennon. Yeah, he did. Oh, that's kind of wow. funny. Mm-hmm. Which, I, I mean, that. knowing that now, I'm like, okay, I get it. Like, mm-hmm. I see what you were doing there. So there's some trivia for this movie. I'll go watch it. Um, <laughs> you don't have to, John. No, I see what Please. Like it. Okay, so just before the car is attacked 
Mm. Um, they're peeling an orange in the back seat. And just before the refugee, refugee camp falls, um, someone else is sharing orange slices. So in films, orange are off, oranges are often represented as impending danger or tragedy. Mm-hmm. So this is also in The Godfather, mm-hmm. too. So yeah, that was something interesting I thought was they used the theme of oranges like a lot of movies do. I don't even remember that in The Godfather. I mean, it's really? been a while. In The Godfather yeah. 2? Mm-hmm. Godfather 2, let's, Duvall is eating an orange when... Let's not Corleone, get into this. Corleone, Mike, when Michael's telling him he's uh-huh. going to move him out, he's eating an orange. He's, and Corleone's eating the orange. Who like, eats oranges? Why? Just in general. A lot of people eat oranges. <laughs> I eat the the yeah, the easy, cuties. Easy to, yeah, oh, the yeah, cuties. that's easy. Little cuties that's are easy. easy to peel. The, 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 simple woman. the more high maintenance, more oranges. I'm not into. Yeah, high like, <laughs> yes. So high maintenance. You oh, got seeds so in there. Maybe you need hands there's like this. Still, oh, there's oh. still stuff left. Over. No, 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 no. It's too much. It's too much. Oh my goodness. Oh my like some I can just throw into my clutch. You couple of princesses. Away. Oh my god. I know. All right, so here's here's where we're going next. We're going to close the book on Children of Men, and we're going to open it up to whatever John has brought. Now, he oh. went from Road Warrior, and he decided on some sort of link to other films. Yeah. Uh, what is the link that connects well, to your other films? The reluctant hero thing. Okay. And I actually, there was a lot of films I went back and forth about. Now, I have two choices, so we can go either way. Well, you're doing you've two movies. Oh, I am. Okay. Okay. Unforgiven. That's Great. my first choice. Haven't seen it. It's why nope. I asked you, did I? I asked you didn't you. ask me that one. No, right now I was asking okay. you if I should I have go not there. seen have that. Seen I it? don't know what the okay. movie is. I mean, not that you can't do it. Just I'm go ahead. Do it. Take the All floor. Right. Here's the deal. It's a retired Old West gunslinger, William Money, reluctantly takes on one last job with the help of his old partner and a young man. Now, this won the best picture in 1992. The Clint Eastwood is the gunslinger. His best friend is Morgan Freeman, which is pretty awesome to have a black uh, or African American, however you want, whatever your designation will be, a uh, partner in an, in the Western, which is, was incredibly rare. And it was supposed to be a, a way of like shutting the door on Westerns, like a neo Western, where it explored the fact that all these legends and these ideas of, of, um, of Westerns that we have from the movies, the John Wayne movies, are a joke, are a lie, are not real. This was supposed to be, this was supposed to show you how it really is and how tough it was and the situations that occurred. William Money, uh, Eastwood, when we first encounter him, is this guy who's like, He's having to take care of pigs to make money. His beautiful wife has just died. He has two kids. And so this kid shows up, the Schofield kid, to convince him to take a job uh, because these prostitutes have been cut up by one of these cowboys has come into town and had sex with her, but he laughed at his small penis, and so, so he cut her face. See, already we're dealing with adult themes Great. in Westerns. Right? <laughs> we're de- no, it's okay, but we're dealing with adult themes in Westerns that we don't see. Yeah. It's a very powerful Western. It's very. I so, haven't seen a lot of baby dicks on film. You're right. Yeah, well, you don't see a baby dick. <laughs> <laughs> no. Well, you said he had a small penis. Yeah, that's so what is that, is that what you all say behind our backs? Baby dicks. <laughs> but uh, this but, is gone <laughs> where we've I never gone to before. An immature, <laughs> But anyway, that's the whole point of why he flips out and cuts her up. And Gene Hackman plays the sheriff, the kind of evil sheriff of the town. And uh, he thinks he's doing the right thing. He's actually doing, he's actually being mean to the, or not, unfair to the prostitutes. Because all he says is, bring us a couple of horses to pay for the damage. Mm-hmm. And the prostitutes, led by Frances Fisher, who was Clint Eastwood's girlfriend at the time, or fiance at the time, well, were like, no, this is ridiculous. Do you think cutting up her face and, and her livelihood is worth a couple of horses? No, these guys should be in jail, blah, 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 and he won't do it. Mm. Uh, and so they, it comes out that they have a, they offer a reward. They pull all the prostitutes there, pull all their money together to offer a reward. Uh, this mm. is what the Schofield kid knows. He convinces Eastwood to do one last job because Eastwood, all his pigs are getting sick, so he needs money to pay rent, feed his kids. He grabs Morgan Freeman. Morgan Freeman agrees to go one last time. And what you find out through the course of the film is that he was actually, Eastwood was one of the most vicious guys ever and it was when he drank he would kill women and children small animals he would kill everything when he was drunk because he was a classic alcoholic and that he would become incredibly angry and human life mattered nothing to him life at all mattered nothing to him and so he is an incredible so he you see him he's this meek guy at the beginning and it isn't until much later in the movie when he has he almost dies from uh, getting shot by Gene Hackman in the first confrontation he gets sick and he has this like two week period where he uh, almost dies and he recovers. And when he recovers is when he becomes William Money again. And you see the switch. And it's such an amazing performance by Eastwood. And uh, Richard Harris is in it playing this like English Bob who's this supposedly this 
you know, a killer or whatever, but, but he only got his reputation by killing Chinese people um, on the railroads, for the railroads. So, he, so people thought he was this great killer or whatever. He shows up, Gene Hackman, tears him to pieces verbally, and then tears him to pieces physic physically, and calls him, and, and uh, messes with a writer that calls him the du Duke of Death. He says the Duck of Death, he's the Duck of Death, and the reason they did that is a kind of way of destroying the John Wayne thing, because he's the Duke. So they used that term and made it the duck to destroy this idea that Westerns were like John Wayne movies. Oh. So it's just a fascinating film that explores all this stuff. And in the end, you have the final confrontation between Eastwood and Hackman. I'm not going to ruin it, but it's a great, great gunfight. And, um, you know, something happens to Morgan Freeman that is very much of the time, of the period, mm -hmm. and uh, which really solidifies your desire for vengeance in the movie. And so that's, uh, to me, it's, a, it's one of my favorite films, and I own it in every way it's come out, VHS. Beta, I mean, VHS, DVD, and Blu-ray. Once again, certain. this beta thing. I apologize, I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> now, how different is Gene Hackman's character in this as opposed to his character in The Quick and the Dead? Uh, it's more how to, it's more texturized. There's more levels to him than there is in The Quick and the Dead. All right. I mean, don't even get me started on that <laughs> movie. Just, I thought just sure, for scale. He, the thing with that movie is that Quick and the Dead could have been a good movie. It, there's every, shadows but, of every, greatness. Right. Everyone is playing surface. Yes. Even Sharon Stone, every time she's pissed, she's got, I got my piss face on. It's like, it's not real. Right. Give me what's going on underneath. That's Russell Crowe wasn't well, terrible. Crow, uh, Crowe's on a whole level. level, level. He's an actor, of course. And Di DiCaprio's in this, and he yes. has a very small part. But even him a little bit, he's a little crybaby whiny thing, and it's not really levels, right? Hackman is good in the film, but he's not, once again. But it's in, just one note. It's right. like but in this the they same make, the whole time. Yeah, and in this they make him human. Like he's trying to build a house, but he's a terrible... He's terrible. Like all his house, his house is all wrong in terms of angles and stuff. Mm -hmm. He's a terrible house builder. So they humanize everyone in the movie, regardless of evil or good. And so when the confrontation happens, it's your choice to who you want to go with, you know? Because he's a sheriff. It's hard to go against the sheriff. Well, not when you're Clint Eastwood, apparently. So. Well, there you go. <laughs> but anyway, he's a reluctant hero because he saves these people. He doesn't. He doesn't necessarily want to be in. He's doing it for the wrong reasons, and then eventually. He uses his evil, uh, and he has this great moment, one last thing with the Schofield kid. After that, he's shot a person for the first time because the kid has been lying the whole time in the movie that he's this guy gunslinger. He's like really distraught by having took and taken someone's life off the earth. And you have this conversation about it, which you never see in Westerns. And he says, he says to him, well, I, I guess they had it coming. And Eastwood has this great line when he looks out, his hair is blowing in the wind. He says, we all got it coming, kid. And that's just like, boom, boom. So anyway. Good when you say... <laughs> Schofield, that's Michael. Wait, who? who what is? What is that? Who's Michael? Who's the actor? It's oh, not it's Michael just one kid who did this movie, and then he never did another movie again. Oh, okay. The last time they found him, he was selling sea dews somewhere in California. <laughs> How no, do you I, know this? Like a, like <laughs> Stacy, we there's. I'm Wait, gonna bring you into the. <laughs> <laughs> it's a jet ski. It's a jet ski. Like we okay. the ride the jet skis. Oh, I know what a jet ski is. What, what is a sea dew? Sea dew is like is the, that brand? Like the brand. Yeah. Oh, like okay. Kleenex, like okay. Kleenex. I didn't grow up around the ocean. Oh my God! So Neither did I. Know, <laughs> I don't know these things. Just call it a jet ski. Stop being so complicated. I apologize. Um, the film won Best Picture. Gene Hackman won Best Actor for supporting. Clint Eastwood won Best Director, and it won Best Film Editing. How have I never heard of this movie? It I, won a shit ton of Oscars. I too am I've heard of it. David Webb people David Webb Peoples wrote it, who did Twelve Monkeys, oh. Blade Runner, oh. and Lady Hawk. If you remember oh. Lady Hawk, the oh. Matthew Broderick film. Hmm. Very nice. Thank you. Thank you for <laughs> Unforgiven. Okay, so for our side, yeah. we went Mad Max Fury Road, post-apocalyptic we went to Children of Men, and we're linking to mm. Michael Caine movie. <laughs> That's right. Michael Caine. I'm just going to let you say it. Have you seen it. the trip? Have you seen the trip? No. You guys the, It's a British it. film, right? It's like yeah, there's two of them. Steve Coogan? Steve Coogan, and I forget the other guy's name, but they do Michael Caine impressions throughout the movie. Oh. It's so, the second one, the trip to Italy, is hilarious because they do this thing where he's like, do you know how many Batmans I've had to bury? <laughs> <laughs> 15 Batmans. I can't put their ears inside the coffin anymore. Oh my so God, funny. that's brilliant. And they I both gotta do, watch do, this. Yeah, you got to. They, you got to see, I see at least the clips on YouTube because they do yeah. the dueling one. And one is more emotional than the other. <laughs> when it gets more emotional, it gets really odd. And, and it's just, oh, it's, you've got to see it. brilliant. It'll make he you laugh. He has such a distinctive voice. I really love it. does. So I picked okay. The Prestige oh, from 2006. Nice 
What is what's your initial prestige thought? I have not seen this one, or I have seen this. one? You have seen this. Okay, one. I have seen this. I'm one. just gonna tell you. I haven't seen, seen it. the Illusionist. Right. And, okay, I always get the two confused. Yes, because they came out at the same time. That's right, yeah. and they're both about like magicians. Yes. And one stars. Okay, the Prestige is Scarlett Johansson, right? Mm-hmm. But then the Illusionist. Who's Johansson? <laughs> you mean Johansson? Jo- <laughs> Yo, Mama. Okay. But then. <laughs> the illusionist is Jessica Biel. Yes, so they both correct. star musicians, your mama, and magicians. beautiful women. <laughs> what's, what's musicians. Name? What's your name? Ashley Johansson. What? <laughs> Ashley uh, Johansson. Johansson. Um. Anyway, uh, that went on a that went off on a whole new rail. Okay. Okay. So two magicians yeah. engage in a competitive one upmanship. In an attempt to create the ultimate stage illusion, starring Hugh Jackman, Christian Bale, Michael Caine, Rebecca Hall, and David Bowie, oh, as well as Scarlett Johansson. Love Directed by Christopher Nolan. Also written by, well, the screenplay was written by Jonathan and Christopher Nolan, but Christopher Priest wrote the novel. The budget was about $40 million and it made about $109 million at the box office. It was a surprising hit. It was good. Yeah, it was I a don't, good movie. <laughs> no, but I mean, magician movies don't, aren't necessarily known for making a lot of money. It was well, right. they were obviously in high demand because there was two of them. <laughs> yeah. so, that always happens, right? A Bug's right. Life and Ants came out at the same yeah, time. Yeah, Friends with Benefits and then the... Oh, oh yeah, no strings, attached. no strings Attached. Armageddon and Deep Impact. That's yeah. right. That's My right. goodness. And then White House Down and yeah. some other... And, uh, Olympus has something. fallen. There Olympus you go. has fallen, right. which was, I swear to God, like a screenplay someone wrote in 1985 and then like left it in the Denny's at 3 a.m. Like <laughs> and then someone found it decades later. Like it was originally supposed to be like Steven Seagal was going to be in it. <laughs> And then they were wow. like, oh, look, I found this. And then You really hate this movie. And then what's-his-face, um, who's 300? What's his name? Gerard Butler. Gerard Butler yeah. um, was like, oh, yeah, I'll star in it because I'm not doing anything. Or Butler, no. however you want to say it. Butler. Yeah, okay. Bueller? I'm just saying you've got Bueller. unique ways of saying it. Um, uh, yeah, no, I don't I don't really like uh, Olympus Has Fallen. I just no, want to throw don't. that out there. You really so, don't. I haven't saying. seen it, so don't know. It's dumb. I'm not going to it's it. got... Who's it? Like, Melissa Leo is in it, and then they uh-huh. drag her off, like, off screen, and then she's, like, saying the pledge, like, screaming the Pledge of Allegiance. Like, it's the most bananas movie I've ever seen. Yeah, and I kind of love it, though. It was a fun old time. It's, it's kind of entertaining. I, I saw it at the I Dome love it. and had a blast watching really? it. Really? Oh, yeah. oh, that would have been an amazing Dome. way to watch great. it. I saw them both in the theaters. Really? White House Down as well. Stacy's catchphrase is, it's bananas. It's bananas. Like, <laughs> it's <laughs> catchphrase. Bananas. Yeah, yeah, that's what I keep thinking. Uh, okay, okay Rebecca Hall. I think, I, I think her, her performance is really like the most beautiful woman. You think so? I think she's pretty. I liked her in The Gift. Um, mm-hmm. She was great in The Gift. That's a but, good movie. That's so good. Go see The Gift right now. <laughs> yeah, turn this off and go see The Gift. Yeah, uh, but come back to it. Yeah. Oh, Anyways, I think her perform like when I first saw this film. This is kind of interesting in my mind, maybe not in yours, but when I first saw this film, I was like, I didn't like her. I didn't like the way she portrayed the character. Ooh. And then I got married and then I had kids and I watched it again and I was like, she is spot on. Wow. Like this is exactly like what a woman would be feeling. So what you're saying, birthing a child really gave you a whole new appreciation. And getting married. Oh, and getting married. <laughs> there you go. Married. So I don't know what it was that like switched. That's what happens. You're I mean, just up. age in general. Mm-hmm changes that too but you grow up and her just the whole thing about you don't love me today and all that i was just like this is just terrible well it's almost a weird subplot too because you have all that stuff going on with trying to create the uh the the uh, illusion of the right tesla and the electricity Mm. it's a very topical i mean historical film which i enjoyed Mm. well and in the movie they talk about a real life magician which they fictionalize on the screen where it's this man and he looks like he's maybe chinese or something and he does all these tricks and they're like the actual the whole thing is that he is this is an act this is an entire act his whole life is an act and um so I looked it up, and it it really was about a man that the same thing. His whole life was an act. He wasn't actually Chinese. Mm-hmm. And, like, he was just like, why would you? Okay. No, and that, then, that was in, um, what's it called? The new, that new Woody Allen film hmm. with um, Emma. Scoop? Oh, wait, no. 
No, no, no. Um, <laughs> new Miss Movies. New. <laughs> Sorry. I was thinking of a Scarlett Johansson yeah. one. No, Johansson. the one with um, uh, Colin Firth and Emma. Yeah, Midnight something like yeah. that. Yeah. No, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, that one. Whatever. Yeah. Um, he plays he plays a magician, but he dresses uh-huh. up like he's he okay. calls it the Orient. Yeah, mm-hmm. uh, he's very politically incorrect, and yes. um, yeah, no, he dresses like that and wears like a little wig with a little, little mm. braid and all this stuff. Anyway, so I guess it's right. based off of the a real magician. Mm. Too. Anyway, moving on. And the guy never years. spoke. The only time he actually spoke in real life was to say, "I am shot. I've been shot." Because like he did the. The bullet catch, which is a, something they do in the movie, and oh. someone actually put a bullet in there. Oh. So that's how he died. Oh, my God. In real life. That's crazy. And I'm just, it, just the whole idea of making your act your life yeah. is insane. That's how Houdini died. Yeah, he, someone he punched, punched him. punched him. Two weeks later, he died from, because they were, because he did this all the time. He would say, you cannot injure me because I have an ability to, like, elude your punch while you punch okay. my stomach he's strong enough to handle it but someone punched him and like I don't know caused some kind of damage inside internally and he bled to death yeah he like wasn't cause he can like form his muscles in a right. way where it doesn't injure himself but this college kid I think he was like a drunken college kid mm-hmm. came up to him or like university student or something came mm-hmm. up to him after a show and was like I heard you can take any punch and he was like well yes but in the and then the kid the kid like punched him but right. didn't tell him while he wasn't yeah prepared like for he him. wasn't yeah. ready for it yeah. and so then ended up yeah. killing him yeah don't believe the Tony Curtis movie where he dies from a Chinese water torture trick that doesn't happen he's drowning it doesn't happen some of these things I'm like is that even really a trick like is that a trick well it's always spectacle the, I mean, because like the things that David David Blaine life. does, I'm like, that's not a trick. Standing at a high height, that's scary. Well, apparently. <laughs> but, yeah, well, his is, I mean, it's all about like pushing your body to the limit. Yeah. Like he likes to do stuff sure. where it's like beyond human capabilities. You have to like train yourself and all that. So yeah. that's like part of part of his thing. Harrison Ford thinks he does tricks. Have you saw that little YouTube video? Wait. Dave, oh. David Blaine went to uh, Harrison Ford's house and yeah. did some tricks, and Harrison Ford. When he did his trick, Harrison would get the fuck out of my house. <laughs> he was out of really my house right freaked now. out. He was really freaked out. Because I'd be I mean, freaked that out. Scary. Okay, he hit so a car what? inside his fruit. There, yeah. Wait, there is another like David Blaine video that's yes. pretty hilarious <laughs> that these guys are yeah. like, David Blaine! Yeah. <laughs> like, oh my God, oh, David Blaine! Blaine. Yeah. yeah, they're like, geeking out. Yeah. I think it's like, wasn't one of them, it's Kanye West and like Woody Harrelson. Yeah. And you're like, how did they know each other? A. B. What is happening? And then Woody Harrelson, like he does... He does the trick, and then Woody is like, I just lost any erection I had. I was like, Woody! Oh, classic. He's so hysterical. Um, Sam Mendes originally wanted to direct uh, this film, but they, uh, but... Christopher Priest, who wrote the novel, had seen the following and uh, or following in Memento, and was like, "I want that guy to do it." Oh, so, good film. That's pretty awesome. That's great. It fits in the no. It fits in the Mendes uh, look, so it would have made sense to have him do it. Yeah. Yeah. No Lemon did a great job, but it would have It wouldn't have been out of the realm of possibility. Josh Hartnett was considered for uh, Hugh Jackman's role. Mm-hmm. Really? That would have been kind of. Hugh Jackman yeah, is really perfect in this role. There was about a two-year period where Hartnett was somewhat relevant. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Now, he was like a Pearl Harbor. <laughs> right. And then uh, That's about I it. I don't know where he is. <laughs> oh, he's a... He I've seen him at Scarlet Dodgers games. Joe Hansen for a while, too. Just throwing back to uh, to this movie, but... He's on a show. You know that. Right? right. He's on Penny Dreadful. Oh, yeah. The, Second with, um, season. Uh, what's her face? Eva, Eva Green. Eva, Eva, Eva yeah, Green. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Okay. Good for him. He's on TV. All right. So I, just, there it is. I just lost in movie fights weeks ago uh, because of I said Josh Hartnett was up and coming and Nick was like, yeah, he's been up and coming for about 20 years. Like, yeah. <laughs> That's right, true. You win. You That's win. Very I'm, true. I'm not going to say anything. All right, so let's go to your next oh, uh, reluctant hero. The film. Matrix. Here's my note. Oh. I'm, I'm assuming yes. you've seen this one. I've seen it. Miss Movies. I still see that. Uh, synopsis. A computer hacker uh, learns from mysterious rebels about the true nature of his reality and his role in the war against its controllers. As most of you probably know this, who are listening, it started start Keanu Reeves, Lawrence Fishburne, Carrie Ann Mouse, Tommy Chong, who really messed it up, Joe Pantoleone, Hugo Weaving, and the dude from Longmire is one of Hugo Weaving's uh, other internet dudes, or whatever they are, those, those guys, the agents. The agents, the yeah. computer agent guys. Yeah. Which are pretty funny, those guys are really funny. Andy and Lana Wachowski, he's, it's Lana now, because of the sex change. That's right. Uh, they wrote it and directed it, 
Um, and one little bit of, we'll get into the, but I want to throw one little bit of trivia before I forget. They brought this to Joel Silver when they were working on another film. Joel Silver said, I'm not going to let you direct it. Yeah. You've got to prove to me you can direct it. And they directed Bound, which I became. Heard Bound's good. Right, it is good. It became uh, like an underground success, like a little quiet, successful film. So there's, mm -hmm. he was like, okay, now you can do The Matrix. Mm -hmm. Who knew this was going to open right. the door to like mass, massive films for them? Yeah. You know? Well, they also wanted, they requested a certain budget. Yeah. And they, the company was like, we're going to give you ten, 10 yeah, million. 10. So what they did is they like shot the opening sequence using all 10 million and then brought it back to them and said, look at what you can do for 10 million, yeah. basically. Yeah. And they were so impressed that they're like, all right, we'll give you the rest of the money. Yeah. Right. It's like, a great opening sequence. <laughs> I was like, how smart is that? And how ballsy that yeah. is to be like, I'm going to. They were like, fuck it. I'm taking all the money. <laughs> yeah. Doing it for like five minutes of the film. This will be a short yeah. film if yeah. we need to. Why try yeah. to make it for 10 million when you can't make it for 10 million and make a shit film? Yeah, right. Want to take the balls. It's ballsy. You're mm -hmm. right. Um, the worldwide was 463 million, a little bit over 463 million, and the domestic was about 171, almost 171 million five hundred thousand dollars, almost. Uh, it won Oscars for best film editing, best sound, best effects, sound effects editing, and best effects of visual effects. Uh, the first time I saw it, opening weekend, Saturday afternoon in Tallahassee when I was attending Florida State in 1999. And then in, some, in March or April of this year, I saw it again because it was on one of the channels, on uh, one of the pay channels, movie channels, mm -hmm. uncut, and I just wanted to watch it. I own the trilogy on Blu-ray, but sometimes when I stumble on a film, I like to yeah. just watch. Uh, my favorite scenes, all the training scenes, the scene where he gets his mouth erased by Agent Smith in the interrogation mm, scene. That's not my favorite. Oh, I love that. <laughs> this is so, something I'd never seen before in film. Yeah. It was yeah. so believable. You're like, that's a dream I've had. That's a nightmare I've had. Yeah. Uh, the Oracle scenes. The scene where he's being awakened by being in the Matrix, you know, uh, the dodging bullet scene, which is what it's known for, uh, the helicopter rescue scene, which is fucking badass, mm -hmm. the scene where he takes the blue or red pill because of the of mm -hmm. the what happens to him when he does, uh, the fight scene in the subway station, and the scenes at the end when he's embracing his power. My least favorite scene uh, are the death scenes. I don't like the death scenes at all. Now, what pill would you take? The one that takes you to like Morpheus oh, and all you, them or would you take the ignorance is bliss pill you mean would I do the Joey Pantelioni choice or would I yeah. stay as Neo oh god I think I would take the Joey Pantelioni choice yeah because like if I, I totally blitz, take I ignorance would, I like steak <laughs> yeah right like, if you yeah. good I don't care if it's real or not yeah I like me a nice juicy steak yeah I don't know I'd call me you know lazy whatever yeah. no I don't need to save the world. Yeah. Yeah. But hence, a reluctant hero film. <laughs> Neo exactly. doesn't probably want to save the world. He certainly doesn't. He was, certainly wasn't looking for this. Right. And then it just came into his lap because of his chase of the white rabbit, uh -huh. and so, which is symbolic of a lot of things. And so, um, but I think this movie is also fantastic because you have a very strong female lead in Carrie Ann Moss. Mm -hmm. Yes, she's in love with him or she's supposed to be uh -huh. in love with him, but she holds her own. That helicopter scene is fucking fantastic. Uh -huh. She is strong and powerful. She's the one yanking it up, you know, uh -huh. from it's all of that stuff. And I think, in a way, Keanu becomes almost, how can I say this correctly without offending anybody, but like almost what he would be the classic female role in the mm -hmm. film, he takes that part. Like, mm -hmm. he's the one that like has to discover his love for her. He's the one that has to like, you know, come to her. She's been very strong the whole time, and she is what mm -hmm. she is. She, so knows. she, she, knows, like, she knows. And she knows, because she knows. Yeah, she knows. Mm -hmm. My least favorite also is when they're trying mm -hmm. to like extract that thing from someone's body or whatever. I'm like, oh, no yeah. thanks. It's a little worm thing. Yeah. I think I'll pass on that. Freaky. <laughs> thanks, okay, friends. so we yeah. did uh, Fury Road, then we did Post Apocalypse Children of Men, then we did My Cocaine Films, and <laughs> the Prestige. And now my Michael Caine film is, this is a dark horse, okay? It I is. I don't think that a lot of people are going to be like, oh my god, yeah, that was I don't think John has seen Kane. it. Let's, I don't know. let's vote. I don't know. We'll see. I don't think so. Secondhand Lions. Yes. It's oh. such a cute uh, film. It really is. Uh, Haley Joel Osment. Yeah, good and job. And Robert Duvall. Yes. 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 Yeah. So it's Michael Caine, Robert Duvall play, oh, wait, hold on, let me read the other <laughs> All right, let's not just go on a tangent, Stacey. Okay. <laughs> A coming-of-age story about a shy young boy <laughs> sent by his irresponsible mother to spend the summer with his wealthy, eccentric uncles in Texas. Come on, that just sounds like a good time. Mm -hmm. It it's does. It's just a cute little feel-good family film. I watch it with my family all the time. I think it's, like, precious. It's, like, adorable. So you've got Haley Joel Osment is Walter. Michael Caine and Robert Duvall plays uncles. Kira Sedgwick is his mom. And you know what I heard is that the... 
like creators of The Closer saw her in this film oh. and hmm. were like, oh, I like her as that type of role. So they kind of modeled that, like she plays like a sassy southern yeah. woman. And so she got that role in The Closer because of this movie. And um, it's directed by Tim McCanley's, uh, who also wrote The Iron Giant. Oh, nice. So there's that. And then uh, my most, uh, my first viewing, like I said, like just with my family at home, I think it was on like TNT one day, mm-hmm. and we were like, oh, what's this? And we just had like a great time watching it. And then my most current viewing, uh, probably like a few years ago. I try and re it, it, but it's like a rainy day, feel good kind of movie yeah. that you watch on like, you know, Lazy Sunday or something like that. So... Um, my favorite scene, any time when Michael Caine or Robert Duvall point a gun at someone, like they always are <laughs> trying to shoot the salesmen right. that come to their house. Yeah. And I like all the flashback scenes, like yeah. to them during, you know, wartime and then like the desert. Right. Because it's so cheesy. It's like the yeah. cheesiest well, flashback The thing scene. I don't like about the flashback scenes are it's so glossy. Like, I like it that, looks though. so like pristine that it's I'm like, this is, I'm, this doesn't make sense to me. Like, no. why isn't it kind of like. Why is everything so colorful? Because it's that just there. bugged me. It's like his memory. That's the woman he loves. That's the most wonderful time in his life. So that's mm-hmm. him remembering a beautiful time in his history. And like when the only time he was ever truly happy. He had a love and a family and a baby and all that stuff. Mm. Um, and so that was, it, you were seeing it through like, you know, his, the way he would have remembered it. It was very glossy. Rosy colored glasses. Yes. St- there you go. Good job with <laughs> you and your metaphors. Idioms. Um, <laughs> so, um, uh, and then my least favorite scene. I don't have really a least favorite scene. I guess just because Kira Sedgwick's character, his mom, is kind of like a shitty mom. She's mm-hmm. kind of terrible. And she eventually realizes this and says, okay, if he wants to stay with his uncles, yeah. fine. I'm going to go off and do my own thing and, you know, date whoever I want. And she kind of just eventually gives him up. Right. And was like, yeah, I, this is for your own good, I guess. But she's she wasn't meant to be a mom. And I think that right. was, like, the saddest part of it. I didn't like when he calls and finds out that she's lied to him. Because it's kind of oh, like the sad. first time that he's probably figuring out that his mom is not who she always says she is or yeah. things like that. That was devastating. I was, like, super sad about that. I was like, yeah. And then, um... Let's see. Now, if you've seen it, yeah. what's your favorite moment in the movie? Or like, what was your overall takeaway from it? Well, I think the I think the the development of the relationship is what's interesting about the movie, right? Because he's Haley is so like not wanting to be there. He's mm-hmm. not wanting, and that's the way it is sometimes with young kids. Like they don't they think oh he's an old person. What do they know? Blah, blah, they don't blah. have a phone. Right? They don't yeah. re- they don't remember. <laughs> they don't know or have the perspective to understand that everybody was young once. Everybody had these experiences that you're about to experience or that you just experienced. And I think. They're coming together uh, because also those guys are, they have a great chemistry between each other. So all those moments where they're talking to him and really kind of trying to get him to understand their place in his family or in his world really um, are, is effective. You know, as, as a man, I've had those experiences myself. And so it's fascinating to watch that on screen. It's, it's, and it's really uh, moving the way they do it. And the lion, isn't there a lion? Like, don't they? There's a lion. Yeah, the they, lion. Yeah. So Second what, hand. What, um, what it's a happens, used lion. It's a used lion. <laughs> right. What kind of happens is that these two old kooks that he thinks are just these harmless old men yeah. and are really grouchy, um, they ended up uh, from their travels, and I can't remember how they got the money, but they have this huge, like, pile of gold or something. Yeah, from, it's like from the sheik or something. Yeah, from the sheik or yeah. something like that, for, like, saving his life, yeah. I think. Um, and so... They've never spent it because they didn't really know what to do with it. They didn't really want anything. But once they discover that you can, like, order stuff through the mail, basically through, like, you know, salesmen, they um, they buy guns, they buy a giant yacht and, like, have it in their little, <laughs> right. literally a little yeah. pond. It's so funny. Yeah. And um, they buy a lion. and um, With the intention of killing it. Yeah, with the intention of hunting it. Yeah. But then they don't want to because it's, like, an old lion. Right. Like them. Yeah, but in, yeah, exactly. But good job uh, spotting that. Um, <laughs> but in reality. But in reality, it was, the lion was like two years old, and it was like a young little lion. And Oh, oh we're going to do sarcasm. Oh, I didn't know this was allowed. <laughs> no, and. Um, you do know me, right? Uh, the, the director, when he was picking out lions, he was like, oh, I'm going to get a female lion. She'll be more docile and calm. But what he didn't realize was female lions are mm. actually the way more aggressive oh, yeah. of the of the species. And the, I hate to that's every species. Yeah, yeah. Th- this is true. Yeah. Wow. And um, <laughs> uh, so yeah, they had you know some trouble with her, I guess. But um, 
Uh, what was your favorite part of the film, Miss Movies? My you favorite just part? recently watched mm. it, right? I like it when the lion tackles him. Like... That's a good part. Mm, that's, um, that's, that's a female stunt. Uh, how, I'm right. like, how do they do that? Like, how does that happen? <laughs> what goes on there? Um, but I also like when he, like, jumps from the car and is like, I'm not going to, I'm mm. I'm deciding that I'm not going to be with you. Mm. I'm not going to stay with my mom and some random dude. Yeah. Like, I'm just going to, I'm leaving. Mm-hmm. It's such an interesting thing to have that as the dynamic that the mom is not. Like, it's so rare to see in films. I mean, Disney just kills the moms off, usually. But like, <laughs> yeah. But, like... Gotta have an orphan Right. In there. Mm-hmm. But, like, for a, for a male figure to, to guide, unfortunately. But, like, yeah. it's... What's interesting in this film is that it's really rare to see the mom see, as, as, a, as a... Not a good person or not a good mom. It's not a lot of Hollywood right. movies take that chance to do it because mothers bring their kids to films and they don't right. want to be seen as kind of a negative thing. So. It'd be interesting to see, like, what were the first years like with yeah. this mom. Right. Like, yeah. What was happening? And where was the dad? Was right. there a dad? Right. Right. Was there? Because she's kind of promiscuous I, in the yeah, film. I don't she's know. She's a big old whore. We can I make lots know. of assumptions. I don't know <laughs> what's going to happen or what's happening. Okay, so we had some, um, some movie link <laughs> tweets. Don't we, Miss Movie? That's right. I'll do it. Okay, so what we do is I tweet out, like, what are your favorite post-apocalypse films to link to our first link uh, so we oh. got a few in. So uh, do we talk about these things? We, we just go just over them. them. We're just okay. you know little shout outs little to shout people. Out to the fans. You know, yeah. you know, yeah. people Interact. that know don't know this even exists. Yeah, you know, right. they're just they're like, wait a minute. Wait. All right. So at Bamage Drain and Diego Crespo and Brian McGrath both all said uh, Fury Road, obviously. Master Splinter, Bruised by Dawn, said Planet of the Apes. Tyler Myers Which had. One? Uh, There's three different ones. First, not the Burton one. Okay, so the Charlton Heston. You know. Mm-hmm. Tyler Myers said Children of Men, The Road Warrior, and Fury Road. So he got all three. He got the trifecta. Oh, wow. So, Whoa. hey now. Brian Hurst and Allison in Wonderland said Demolition Man. Thomas Zelenka. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Children of Men. Nick James, I Am Legend, and This Is the End. Alex Jamison nope. and Mikey Campolini, Book of Eli. Jamie Habit said The Matrix, and April O'Donnell said Snowpiercer and Twelve Monkeys. Mm. I Snow love Piercer Snowpiercer. Snowpiercer is a good movie. Good Fantastic choice. film. I actually saw that the other day, and it's showing on the pay channels. So it's, yeah, it's, it's good. On, yeah, it's on Netflix now. Yeah, it's on Netflix too, yeah. Absolutely. There you go. Well, I, um, so that's it. This is the end. Is not, <laughs> this is the end is not a post-apocalyptic film. Well, uh, it's more of a... During the apocalypse. Yeah, it's, a, it's, yeah. it's an apocalyptic film. Yes, it's yeah. yes. post-apocalyptic film. But True. Book of Eli is one that people don't talk about enough. I sure, like that is life. such a good film, and the when you see the twist at the end, you're just like, oh wow. Yeah, you're like, holy yeah, shit. Yeah. Spoilers? Spoiler. No, I'm not gonna spoil it. Don't worry. Um, <laughs> no, I like that film. Yeah. A lot of people don't talk about Boy and His Dog either, which is the Don Johnson post. I don't know. I don't know about it's that. Don one. Johnson before Miami Vice. Uh, well, what do you kids know? No, I know Miami oh, Vice. Okay. Yeah, Colin no, Farrell. No. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Get out. Yes, Get I know. out. It's a show in the eighties. <laughs> With the blazers. With the blazers. Mm-hmm. But yeah, um, the boy and his dog, it's supposed to, he has to, that's it, it's, it's him. Him and his dog. And they're mm-hmm. navigating the post-apocalyptic world. And they have to make these choices and they have to do these things. And in the end, he ends up choosing his dog over someone. And it's mm-hmm. because he's already built this connection. And it's like, even, even in the post-apocalyptic world, there is this ability to connect, to, to create a connection no matter what's happening. Mm-hmm. You know, and it's fascinating, fascinating exploration of stuff. And you also like The Road. The road, um, I saw the road about a year after my father passed, and when that scene happens in the movie, I cried like, uh, like my friends had to like console me, and I'm not a crier. Well, I, you know, maybe I'm a crier, but like I, I got real, real emotional. So that film is always a special place in my heart because it's, it's, it's well done. It's scary as fuck, especially when they're in the house and they discover what's in the basement. Don't tell me. Yeah, I, I don't know. But now, no, I want to see it. But no. I want to see it though. I know Please. it's good. Isn't it something about like he has two bullets left? Right. Well, yeah, but the, the, the film is more about him trying to guide his son as much as possible into mm-hmm. this new world. And it actually has a bad mom. Charlize plays the mom. And Ooh, so, really? yeah, in, in, it's all in flashback. Oh. So, because it's all, it starts, v, it's Vigo and the kid. And I forget the kid's name. I forget who the kid is. I know it's someone famous. But, like, they progress through these different situations and journeys. And in the end, he, um, things happen and uh, the kid survives. But, like, it's just a fascinating exploration of, of what can happen even in this situation of steering your son into adulthood. Unfortunately, due to some 
technical difficulties, we had to end the episode there. Um, just want to go over the list with you guys one more time before I say goodbye. We started with our feature film, Fury Road. We then branched off into post-apocalyptic films. Stacy and I chose Children of Men, and John chose The Road Warrior. Off of The Road Warrior, John went with the reluctant hero theme. He then talked about Unforgiven and The Matrix. Off of Children of Men, Stacy and I chose Michael Caine films. I talked about The Prestige, and she talked about Secondhand Lions. So that is our Six Degrees of Feature Film. You can find us at, let's see, I am at Miss Movies on Twitter. Stacy is at SOHoward2012 on Twitter. And you can find John at The Roka Says on Twitter as well as the Top 10 Podcast and Far, Far Away. He also has a podcast called Cast of Characters, so you can see him in a variety of different places. Thank you so much for joining us today, and we hope to see you again next time. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye.